Today we are going to start our unit on statistics. <laughs> okay, statistics is defined as the study of how to collect, organize, analyze, and interpret numerical information from data. In real life, we want information about a population. It is usually impossible to study every member of that population and collect data. Instead, we take data from a small sample of the population. This data is called a statistic. We're going to watch the video distinguish between a population and sample. So, oops, sorry. As we watch this video. How can the relationships between population and sample help you understand a statistical study of high school students who have a driver's license? In this lesson, you will learn the relationships between population and sample by comparing and contrasting their characteristics. Let's review. A population is the entire group of interest which we wish to describe or draw conclusions about. When we talk about the population of a country, like the U.S., for example, we are talking about every single person who lives there. A sample is a group of units selected from the population. If we take a sample of the population, we select some of the members of the population, but not all. A common misunderstanding is confusing population, sampling frame, and census. The population is the entire group for which a generalization is to be made. Suppose we want to study dolphins to make a generalization about some aspect of all dolphins. The population is all the dolphins that have ever existed, currently exist, or will ever exist in the future. The sampling frame is all the members of the group who can be sampled. The sampling frame in this case consists of all the dolphins that currently exist. However, because the sampling frame consists of all the dolphins that can be sampled, and it would be impossible for a scientist to be able to take a sample from all the dolphins in the world, the sampling frame would probably consist of the dolphins that live in a certain geographic location. A census is when we survey the entire population. So in this case, a census would be the study of every single dolphin in the world. And as we already discussed, that would be impossible, so we wouldn't be able to take a census of the dolphins. Core lesson. A survey was taken based on a national sampling of 1,000 teenagers selected at random from all U.S. teenagers who have a driver's license. The findings of the survey show that 54% of teenage drivers receive a moving violation within the first year of obtaining their driver's license. Describe the population. The population of the study consists of everyone about whom we want to make an inference. In this problem, it is all the teenagers in the United States who have a driver's license. Notice that we don't say that the population is all the teenagers in the United States past, present, and future who have a driver's license, as we did with the dolphins. Due to the way society changes so quickly, it wouldn't make sense to make such a generalization. Consider the sampling frame. It could be the entire population if the person conducting the survey has access to the records of every single teenager in the United States who has a driver's license. It may be that they only have access to those teenagers in the Midwest. If that is the case, the sampling frame is all of the teenagers who live in the Midwest and have a driver's license. The researcher needs to consider whether or not the sampling frame would be appropriate for a generalization about the entire population. Could we apply the information from teenagers in the Midwest to all teenagers in the United States? And then a census would be to collect the data from every single teenager in the United States who has a driver's license. Describe the sample. 
The sample in this study consists of everyone who is surveyed from the population. In this problem, it is the 1,000 selected teenagers in the United States who have a driver's license. What is the variable of interest? The variable of interest is what we are studying or the responses that are surveyed. In this problem, it is whether or not the teenage driver received a moving violation within the first year of obtaining their driver's license. How is the statistical inference expressed? The statistical inference is the claim being made about the entire population based on a sample. In this problem, it is the 54% of all teenage drivers in the United States who receive a moving violation within the first year of obtaining their driver's license. Reliability is whether or not the survey would consistently give the same results if given the same sample repeatedly. For example, if you have a bathroom scale and you step on it to measure your weight, then you do it a few more times without changing the conditions, such as what you are wearing or what you might be holding, and you get wildly different results, you might question the reliability of that scale. For the purposes of our problem, if we use this survey one day with a group of teenagers, then we give the same group the same survey again for several days, assuming that they have not had any moving violations in that time period, will it yield the same results? If so, then it is reliable. Reliability focuses on the tool being used. Sampling variability is the concept that more than one sample of the same size from the same population could yield different results. For example, if we want to study 10-pound dumbbells, and we have nine samples of these dumbbells, and we weigh each of them, do we consistently get the same average weight? If so, then there isn't much variability in the weights, and we can say that if you purchase one of these 10-pound dumbbells, it is very likely to weigh 10 pounds. In this problem, making an inference about all teenage drivers in the United States based on this one study may not give the most accurate information. A different sample of 1,000 teenage drivers could give a different percentage. Variability focuses on the samples being used. In this lesson, you have learned the relationships between population and sample by comparing and contrasting their characteristics. Relationships between population and sample help you understand a statistical study of high school students who have a Sorry. Okay. So it says, we watched the video, it says define the following terms. What's a population? Population is the entire group of interest which we wish to describe or draw conclusions about. A sample is a group of units or subjects selected from the population. The census is where you survey the entire population. In this study, a survey was taken based on national sampling of 1,000 teenagers selected at random from all U.S. teenagers who have a driver's license. The findings of the survey show that 54% of teenage drivers receive a moving violation within the first year of obtaining their driver's license. They want us to describe the population. Well, it's all the teenagers, we, you just saw this in the video, but it's all the teenagers in the United States that have a driver's license. They described the sample. The sample was a, th a thousand selected teenagers in the United States with a driver's license. My variable of interest is whether or not the teenager received a moving violation within the first year of obtaining their driver's license. What makes a survey reliable and what does it focus on? When you continue to get the same result after obtaining samples of the same measurement is what makes your survey reliable. What does it focus on? The focus is on the tool being used. What is sampling variability and what does it focus on? More than one sample of the same size from the same population can give different results. Okay? You can vary if you picked, if you picked a, 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 a 
sample, a different sample from the same population and get different results. And then the focus is on the samples being used. All right, so next they give us, they want to know what, a, 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 talking about a simple summary, or not, I'm sorry, they're giving you a simple summary. So data from an entire population is called a parameter, where data from a sample of a population is called a statistic. So for example, it says a scientist studies a herd of mule deer to learn about their dietary habits. Identify the population in the sample. Your population is going to be all mule deer. The sample is the mule deer in his herd, in the herd that he's studying. Another example, a music store has different clubs for different musical genres. In all, the clubs have 162 members. The store gives comment cards to all 54 members of its 80s rock and roll, rock club, to find out about satisfaction with the club's features. It says for A, identify the total number of the population, which would be 162. The sample is the 54 members of the 80s rock club. Okay? All right, you try this one. Hit pause, come back when you're ready. And hopefully you got four. Gene pulled a random sample from a population and calculated a sample statistic. Gene can use this statistic to draw an inference about what? Only one answer is correct. The corresponding sample parameter, well, if you have a sample, you don't have a parameter, you have a statistic. And four, or the, um, the population size, no, that's not gonna tell me anything about the population size. The corresponding population statistic, if you have a population, you have a parameter, not a statistic. So the only one that makes sense is four. All right, so this one says all samples must be randomly selected. What does that mean? Well, it means that all subjects have the exact same probability or chance of being selected. So now we're gonna watch a video called sampling. All right. You're, while, I, while you're watching that, see if you can f fill out this information, okay? So, let me get this video going here. What? Still searching YouTube for math help? Are the videos from 2006 really help? Sampling. Simple, convenience, systematic, cluster, and stratified. To find things out about a population of interest, it is common practice to take a sample. A sample is a selection of objects or observations taken from the population of interest. For example, a population might be all apples in an orchard at a given time. We wish to know how big the apples are. We can't measure all of them, so we take a sample of some of them and measure them. The method chosen for taking the sample depends on the nature of the population and the resources available in terms of time and money. The ideal is for each object in the population to be equally likely to be chosen as part of the sample. This is called an unbiased sample. It is also desirable for the sample to be representative of the population. If the population of apples were two-thirds red and one-third green, the sample should be similarly split. Note that no matter what we do, there will always be sampling error or variation due to sampling, as we are looking at a part of the population, not the whole population. The video on variation covers these concepts more thoroughly. This video presents five methods of sampling. Simple random sampling, convenient sampling, systematic sampling, cluster sampling, and stratified sampling. For each method, we will outline the process and the advantages and disadvantages. Simple random sample. Simple random sampling is theoretically the ideal method of sampling. You list each member of the population and use random numbers to decide which objects are in the sample. Each object is equally likely to be selected. This produces an unbiased sample, which we hope is representative. However, it can be difficult and expensive to take a simple random sample when dealing with people. Simple random sampling is more practical when the population is geographically concentrated and when a good sampling frame exists. A sampling frame is a list of all the people or objects in the population of interest. 
simple random sampling can be more easily implemented for natural and manufacturing populations. Convenient sample. Convenient sampling is just that, convenient. You ask people nearby or people who walk past at a shopping mall. Or you take the next 20 objects off the production line. You do what is easy or convenient. Convenient samples are often biased in some way, but for a quick and cheap poll it may not really matter. Convenient samples can also have self-selection bias when people choose to participate because they have an interest in the issue in question. Systematic sampling. With systematic sampling, you choose a starting point at random and then systematically take objects at a certain number apart. For example, if there are a thousand in the population and you want a sample of 50, you would take every 20th object. Systematic samples are easier to administer than simple random samples and are usually a good approximation of a random sample. However, if there is a pattern in the population, certain types of objects could be chosen more or less often than others. Cluster sampling. In cluster sampling, the population is divided into clusters which are then chosen at random. For example, departments of a business can be clusters or suburbs within a city. Within each cluster, all of the objects are included in the sample. Cluster sampling can be more convenient and practical than simple random sampling. However, if the clusters are different from each other with regard to the elements we are measuring, it can lead to bias or non-representativeness. Stratified sampling. Stratified sampling seems like cluster sampling, but the strata or groups are chosen specifically to represent different characteristics within the population, such as ethnicity, location, age or occupation. Within each group, a random sample is taken, sometimes in proportion to the size of the group. Stratified sampling can lead to a very good random representative sample. However, it can be complex to administer, and a sampling frame with considerable information about the population is required. There are other sampling methods. The five explained here give an idea of the advantages and disadvantages of various methods. You should attempt to use the sampling method that produces the best result for the resources you have available. If your sample has known bias, this should be taken into account in analysis and reporting. Okay, so... Okay, so... We hopefully you de you uh, defined each of these. It says simple random. To define that, it's going to be, or I'm sorry, it says watch the video. In this video, you will keep men they will keep mentioning the different types of bias. What does it mean when a sample statistic is biased? It means that a sample is biased when certain members of the population are more likely to be part of the sample than others, so which means the sample does not properly represent the population. Hold on, I'm trying to find my pen. Okay, sorry. So we're going to define each of these sampling techniques listed below and on the following page. So the first one they talked about was a simple random sample. Okay, and that says you list each member of the population and use random numbers to decide which ones will be part of the sample. Every subject is equally likely to be chosen and every possible grouping of the same size is equally likely to be chosen. Your advantages, the most random method, it's a most random method, which means you're going to get more accurate results. And it's better when a population is in a smaller area and there is a list of all members of the population. Disadvantages, it's very difficult and expensive to get a truly, truly random sample. A convenient sample is, like she said, it's convenient. It's an easy, it's, it's really easy to get because it's quick and convenient. It's like taking the first 20 items you see or the first five people that walk by. You have no idea if they're representative of your population or not. Advantages, it's quick, it's cheap, it's easy. Your disadvantages is it's, it's going to be biased you are not taking a good um, sample. <coughs> systematic 
Systematic means that it's randomly, you randomly choose a starting point in the population and then you choose like every nth member of the population to be a part of your sample. Like you just line them up and pick every 20th person. Advantages, it's easier to, it's easy to administer and it's pretty random. Disadvantages, if there's a pattern in the population, certain types of objects might be chosen more or less often than other, others. If for some reason you lined them up in such a way that, I don't know, I don't know, maybe you in, inadvertently did it alphabetical. Okay, I don't know. A cluster sample. A cluster sample is when you take the population and you divide it into clusters that have something in common, such as geographic location. A few clusters are randomly chosen and all members of those chosen clusters become part of the sample. The advantages of that is it's more convenient and practical than simple random. And your disadvantages is if the clusters are all different, you won't get a representative sample of the population. Stratified. Stratified is when your population is divided into groups that share similar characteristics such as age or profession. And then a random sample of each group is taken to become part of the sample. Advantages is it can give a very good random representative sample because it makes sure every group is included. Disadvantages, it's complex to administer and you have to have a lot of information about your population. Okay, so some practice questions. It says a certain statistic, statistics class has 15 girls and 10 boys. Samples of the students are chosen at random. Each sample consists of one girl and two boys. Does this sampling method result in a simple random sample for the class? What do you think? I say no, because it was if it was a simple random, then every possible grouping of three students could exist, such as three girls or three boys. Um, five, identify each of the following samples by naming the sampling technique used. Cluster, convenient, simple, random, stratified, or systematic. A, over a period of two days, measure the length of, of time every fifth person coming into a bank waits for a teller service. That is going to be systematic because you basically are counting every fifth person that comes in. All right, B, you take a sample of five zip codes from the Cleveland metropolitan region and use every elementary school from each of the zip code regions. Determine the number of students enrolled in first grade in each of the schools selected. That would be cluster because you're taking a cluster from every elementary school and then you're taking a sample of that. C, split internet users into different age groups and then select a random sample from each age group to determine the amount of time they are online each month. That would be stratified. And then D, ask five friends for their opinions about the student cafeteria. You're asking your friends, that's just convenient. E, pick a random sample of students enrolled at your college and determine the number of credit hours they have each accumulated toward their degree program. If you just pick a random sample at your college, that would be simple random. Okay? So, next, we're talking about, we talked about bias, this biases. It says random sampling is important because we need to avoid bias in our samples. Let's now take a look at the different forms of bias that can occur when choosing a sample. So we want to define the, the following types of bias. You have what we call undercoverage bias, and what that means is when parts of your population are not included in the sample. It occurs in convenient samples or when members of the population can't be included for some strange reason. And, and so it's like, kind of like what it sounds. You're undercovering your sample. You're not including enough of your variables. Non-response bias. Non-response bias is when the subjects chosen to be in your sample won't participate or can't be reached. And then you have your response bias in if your subjects lie or they don't remember details or the response are skewed by the way a question was worded, like a leading question, something like that, that's your response bias. You've got to be very careful when you pose your questions when you do surveys and samples. There are two sampling techniques that always, always result in bias. And that is convenience because it doesn't use a random, it doesn't use random methods. And it's under coverage bias because the sample is not good representation of the entire population. 
Okay. Um, voluntary response sampling is when a subject has gone has to go out of their way to include themselves in the sample. Example. A magazine article asks people to call a 1-800 number to answer a survey on whether or not they exercise regularly. This is going to be, they volunteer. You're not making them, so who knows what you're getting. Or to vote for your favorite singer on American Idol, you text a specific number on your smartphone. This is, again, under coverage bias because people with strong opinions, usually negative, are the ones who take time to be included in the sample and the sample does not properly represent the population. In other words, if people can't be bothered to vote, you're not getting it and you're not getting their opinions. So again, that would be under coverage bias. All right, you try this one, hit pause, come back when you're ready. And hopefully you got two. It says, decide whether the sampling method could result in a biased sample. Explain your reasoning. The Candlelit Dinner Candle serve Store surveys its Monday customers to find out their opinion on a new scented candle. And it says the sample is probably not biased. It's a random sample. It says the sample could be biased because the sample does not include customers who shop there on days other than Monday. You know, you're limiting your, it's not completely random because you picked a specific day. That's not random. Okay, try this one, hit pause, come back when you're ready. And hopefully you got two. Okay, so it says determine which sampling method is more likely to be representative of the population. Tom surveys 40 moviegoers by randomly choosing their ticket numbers. And he got that 60% like the movie. Kim surveys 40 moviegoers that entered the movie theater in the first hour, and then 80% liked the movie. One says Kim's method is more likely to be represented of the population because she uses a convenient sample. We know that if you're using a convenient sample, that that's biased. All right. Tom's method is more likely to be represented of the population because he uses a random sample. All of the moviegoers are just as likely to be accept, uh, picked. All right, try this one, hit pause, come back when you're ready. And hopefully you got three. It says at Rosa's summer job with a research company, she must get a representative sample of people from her town to answer a question about health habits. Which of the following methods could be used to get a representative sample? Selecting people who are in the hospital. Well, hello, if you're picking people in the hospital, they're not going to have good health habits, obviously. Um, by gathering responses from women who own businesses in town. That's only going to give you the health habits of women who own businesses. Um, three, selecting people randomly from a computer list. Obviously, that's pretty random. Sorry, I'm trying to move this. And then four, selecting every 10th person as they enter a fast food restaurant. Um, this would be good if you weren't picking a fast food restaurant because obviously those are the people who are going to have obviously bad health habits if they're going to fast food restaurants all the time. So this one, again, is the most random that you can get, so that's going to be the best. All right, it says, the host of a national talent competition invites all of the show's viewers to vote for their favorite contestant. To vote, the viewer send a text message to a contestant's number. Identify the population in the sample and give it a reason why the sample could be biased. Well, in this case, your population is all the people who view the talent competition, and the sample are, are just the viewers who decided to send a text message. Okay, this would, I would again, have under coverage bias because it's voluntary response. There's people that have strong opinions, but they can't be bothered to call in. So that's going to be biased. Tell whether the survey question may be biased or otherwise introduces bias into the survey. Describe a way to correct the flaw. Would you rather watch an exciting basketball game or a dull basketball game? Um, this is going to introduce response bias because the question is trying to skew responses by using the words exciting and dull. First, correct it by moving these two words. 
Although then you'd have, would you rather watch a basketball game or a basketball game? So I'm not really sure what removing those two words really accomplishes. Next, identify the type of sampling described. Then tell if the sample is biased. A newspaper is sponsoring a poll and wants to find out the preferences of farmers across the state regarding the state governor's election. The newspaper surveys farmers in the local area to gather their data. So it's a convenient sample because only the local farmers are surveyed, not those across the state. This is under coverage bias because it leaves out a lot of farmers from the other areas. Last, a principal wants to know if the students at her school like the food served in the cafeteria. So she asks every 10th student in the, lunch, in the line at lunch. Identify the type of sample and describe the population, then tell if the sample is biased. This is systematic because she's picking every 10th student in line at lunch. It shouldn't be biased because there's no reason to think there's a pattern of like or dislike in the way the students line up. Okay, so that would be a pretty good one. All right, and so let's see, what do we have? What is the definition of a statistic? You can copy that from the first page. The difference between a parameter and a statistic, a parameter comes from a population and a statistic comes from a sample of the population. Why is randomness important? Because if it's not random, then you're going to get biased. Describe the different sampling techniques. You're going to have to go back and list them on your, well, they're right here, but you can list them and describe them. And five, which techniques result in what and what types of bias should be avoided? Go to that slide on our biases and you can answer that question. So we are at homework. Happy homeworking and I will see you next time.